Hey everyone, my name is Thomas Crow Jacobson. I'm the lead for our technical content marketing team, and I'm based out of the Unity Copenhagen office. In my team, we focus on creating technical educational content, which helps you build better games. We do that across many different formats, from blog posts to video tutorials, ebooks, and even demo projects. Our primary focus is best practices for professional game developers. And so one of the cool things about working with that topic is that I get to work with both internal and external Unity experts. Many of the tips I'll be sharing today does come from one of these teammates. For this presentation, I picked 20 actionable tips, which I hope can help you and your team be more productive. I picked five tips from each of these four new eBooks, which we recently created in my team. Some of the tips will focus on day-to-day -day workflows, and be very feature specific. Others will focus a little bit more on general best practices and thus be more about long-term productivity games. All right, so here's a full list of all the tips I'll be covering. Let's dig in. First of all, is keeping track of all the new features in Unity can be a little overwhelming. So let's get started by simply highlighting five features even the experts might have missed. Features which I would recommend making part of your day-to-day -day workflows if you haven't done already. The device simulator makes it easy to simulate how a game will appear and behave on different mobile devices. It's easy to test rotation, and it's easy to simulate safe areas. You can also test code that responds to device-specific behaviors. If you're working with mobile game development, this is really a time saver. In the latest LTS versions of Unity, you can now also open as many focus inspector windows as you like. This makes it so much easier to compare values or make edits to more than one game object at the same time. Simply right-click the object and select properties to open a new inspector window. You can then reposition and resize the focus inspector in the same way as other windows. If you're like me, like to use a lot of hotkeys to speed up your workflows, you should also check out the shortcuts manager. It provides a nice visual overview of your current key bindings. That way, it's now much easier to assign new hotkeys while avoiding conflicts with the existing. As your scenes grow larger, it's easier for things to get in the way on what you're working on right now. A hack to solve this was to simply deactivate game objects. But the problem is that can lead to unintended behavior at runtime. Instead of this old hack, try out the new scene visibility toggle. That's the eye icon you're seeing on the right in the animation. By talking this mode, you can hide or you can show objects in the scene view, but without affecting visibility in the game mode. You can also make game objects not selectable in the scene view using what we call scene picking. That's a hand icon you're seeing in the scene hierarchy. That way you can avoid you accidentally select a certain object while working in the scene, while still ensuring that everything works just like normal when you go into game mode. Unity presets allow you to save multiple changes as a preset template. That makes it easy to apply the same settings to many other assets in just a few clicks. This can be particularly efficient for configuration of default import settings. Not only is it a great way to speed up your workflows, but it also helps consistent standards and format constraints for your imported assets. We recently released an ebook with more than 70 productivity tips including the ones I just mentioned here. The tips are also available as a free part blog post series, if you prefer that format. We'll post links to both of those resources in the chat. All right, so switching gears a little. I also wanted to talk to you about mythology and not just new features. And while profiling will not speed up your day-to-day -day workflows short-term, the long-term benefits of looking into performance optimization can really be massive, particularly for really large community projects. The best gains from profiling requires you to start early on. You don't want to start the process just before you're about to ship a game. However, you also need to make sure it's part of an ongoing process through the entire development cycle. One of the key benefits of starting profiling early and doing it often is that you can establish a performance signature for your project. That way, it's also much easier to benchmark performance as your product grows and ident identify when things go wrong. Our second general tip for profiling is the exercise of budgeting. You want to start by defining your target device uh, hyper tiers, both those which are high-end and low-end devices. 
Based on that, you can then create a memory budget so you know how much you can spend when designing scenes and levels. It can also be useful to go further and set content budgets around mesh and shader complexity, as well as for texture compression. By agreeing on performance constraints as a team early in the process, it's much easier to control the development as a team. It's also a great way to avoid potential conflicts between programmer and artists. Another good rule of thumb is to have a significant buffer for frame idle time. That way you've got a little bit of breathing room to account for real world temperature fluctuations. On mobile, we often say that it's recommended to have up to 35% of buffer time. That may sound like a lot, but that way you can ensure you're avoiding thermal and battery issues by giving the mobile chips adequate time to cool down. Profiling results are always most accurate when you're profiling the bills on the actual target device. I know it's easier just to profile in the editor or use your own smartphone as a testing device, but that simply won't be representative of how your users will experience your game. You want to make sure you're profiling the actual target device and mainly on the low-end hardware tiers. Once you establish your hardware tiers and define the memory budget, it's time to look into where all the bottlenecks are. There are many ways to approach profiling, but consistency is really the key to get the best results. So define process for the profiling from the beginning and stick to it as a team. A good general rule is that you want to start with a top to bottom approach. That means that you start with B profiling disabled, and it means you want to focus on identifying the biggest problems first, so you focus on where there's the highest impact. From there, you can work your way into the specifics. This flowchart you're seeing on the right side is an example of, recommended, of a recommended profiling process. It was actually created by one of our teammates, Steve McGrail, who had profiled more than 100 different projects. And we'll post a link in the chat if you want to check out how Steve's, Steve's recommendation to a simple profiling process uh, looks like. All right, so profiling can feel a lot like detective work. You need to have a consistent process and you need to have a methodology in place for it to work. But you also need to know all the tools you have at your disposal to get the best results. Unity offers a whole range of tools, including the memory profiler, the profile analyzer, frame debugger, and much more. But there are also a wide range of great tools available from partners such as Microsoft, ARM, Sony, and Apple to mention a few examples. To get the best results, you want to use a combination of both Unity and platform-specific profiling tools. We often hear from our customers that profiling and performance optimization can be a little bit of a daunting topic, but it doesn't have to be that way. We recently launched more than three ebooks with more than 200 pages of optimization tips and best practices. A lot of those tips come from Steve and his team and are very actionable in terms of doing performance optimization on your own project. They're also all free, and we'll post a link in the chat to where you can download all of them. The next five tips are about project organization, and it's also about how to get set up for success in the long run. The tips are somewhat also related to how you establish an efficient version control process by getting organized and staying organized. Let's start with project structure. You want to plan the folder structure carefully from the beginning. Define a taxonomy which works well here now, but also one which scales well as your product grows in years to come. Think of it as sort of like an internal agreement that everyone in the team should organize the files by. You also want to avoid creating folders you're not sure if you will need for later or which are likely to change. The whole goal is to avoid too much refactoring. In general, you also want to store your content files within the asset folder whenever that's possible. And finally, try to stay away from spaces in the file and, and folder names. You can simply use camera case notation as an alternative for spaces instead. There is no right way to organize your folder structure, but a common approach which we often recommend is organizing product folders by asset type. Here are two examples of what that could look like. There are many reasons for why this is a popular practice for Unity games. The main reason is simply that it scales well as a project grows. Another tip to consider is creating a separate folder for non-production scenes and testing. That way, it's much easier to differentiate between what we created for testing purposes and what will make it into the final production. 
You can then always add more subfolders with usernames in certain areas to ensure you have a clean separation of the files you need across the different uh, test areas. Another thing to consider is using namespaces to avoid conflicts between class names being declared in the production versus in the testing corpus. In general, a very uh, general rule of thumb is that you want to split up your larger complex scenes and assets into smaller bits. It's often better to have several smaller scenes than having one mega scene. The same thing goes for complex prefabs, where you can leverage nested prefabs to create more modularity. This way, artists and designers can better collaborate in parallel while minimizing the risk of merge conflicts. It also makes tracking level design changes much easier in, in version control. Then you can simply use the scene manager to load multiple scenes as you need them during runtime. And similarly, you can also make use of scriptable objects for storing data whenever possible. That way, you can also separate logic and data in a more clean and scalable way. So this is probably the easiest tip I'll present today, but perhaps also the one which we all tend to forget. And that is you want to commit little, but you want to commit often. Just like tasks need to be broken down into smaller chunks, commits should be exactly the same. So that does mean committing little, but doing it for every single task you need to fix. In general, we say that you want to make a commit for each uh, feature or for each task, so it's easier to track the changes in your version control, not just here now, but also further down the, the, the line. You also want to make sure that your commit messages are as meaningful as possible. It should be easy for your teammates to guess what the commit is all about. And it should also be easy for you to remember a year from now. Using keywords or perhaps even thinking about how you might search for the commit later on can be a really useful trick for creating good descriptions. If you're using a system like Fura, you can also include the ticketing number or even agree on a standard that works for the team like in the example here in the slide. It's a good idea to agree on standards that go beyond just the project folder and structure though. You might want to agree on naming standards for your game objects, scenes, prefabs, etc. as well. Just like with the commits, it's best to use descriptive names, and it's better to be specific than leave out many details. Let me show you an example. So in this example, it's tempting to use short names to save a few seconds here and there. But what might be logical for you today may not be so straightforward a year from now, or more importantly to another person in the team. A good name is generally one which everyone intuitively understands and which won't need renaming later on. A good rule of thumb is to achieve that, or to achieve that, is simply to choose a name which you can pronounce. Taking too many shortcuts and saving a few seconds here and there on naming can be a really, really bad long-term investment. We've recently created a best practice guide on version control and project organization. So if you're looking for more tips, check out the ebook if you want to learn more. We also created several blog posts on the topic and we'll post chats to both of it in the chat. All right, so you can also go one step further in terms of standardizing uh, terms and uh, terminology across the team. And you can do that by creating a code style guide for everyone. A code style guide is essentially about taking the guesswork out of the code formatting and the code conventions for everyone in your team. It's about avoiding too many inconsistencies and too much refactoring. There are no set in stone rules. But the key is that you need to decide what's best for your team. And then once you decide it, have everyone stick with it. A general advice when creating a style guide is to not overcomplicate though. You need to balance simplicity with having just enough details so everyone understands the basic rules. But there's no need to account for every possible edge case. Again, I think the key objective is more to make the code feel like it was written by one person rather than having 20 different styles. In terms of what it should cover, most guides generally include something like general naming conventions, guidelines for using namespaces. You may also want to have some rules on naming and indentation styles on how you do commenting and of course, code casing uh, rules uh, for the team. Microsoft and Google both offer fairly comprehensive C-sharp code style guides. They're both excellent starting points uh, for creating your own guide as well. You don't have to use the whole thing though. You can simply cherry pick the things which make sense for you or use it as a source of inspiration. 
With the help of a couple of Unity developers, we actually also created our own Unity C Sharp Code Star Guide, specifically for Unity game projects. It's available, available on a Unity GitHub, and we'll add a link to that in the chat as well. Script templates allow you to customize what a new C Sharp script looks like. Maybe you want to remove the start and update calls, and maybe you want to add your product namespaces to it. But once you establish formatting rules for your style guide, you can also configure the script templates to help you enforce some of those standards. So every time someone creates a new C Sharp script file in your project, it will generate the placeholder code which your team defined. Maintaining a clean code base and sticking to the formatting rules you agreed on can result in a lot of manual work. But you can also automate a lot of process directly in your IDE. Most IDEs, such as Visual Studio, offer you tooling to enforce formatting rules. And some tools can even help you convert its existing project files and reformat the code for you in just a few clicks. If you'd like to learn more about code style guides and how to create them, check out our new ebook. I also recently published a blog post with some few, with, with a few actual tips if you prefer a more quick read format. We'll post links to that in the chat here as well. That concludes the tips from, from today. I know that was a lot in a short amount of time, but if you're interested in more best practice content, check out some of our other ebooks. Use the URL in the bottom of the slide to find an overview of all of them. We'll also post a link in the chat to it as well. With that, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope some of these tips were useful and you can make use of them in your own project. Feel free to connect with me on social media if you like. I hope you all have a great night. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining once again.